Okay, we, we now have about uh, 20 minutes for questions and answers. I think there was um, a lot of very rich material there, and I think that the quotations you showed, Mark, on your first slide, some of those have been rather blown apart by what you've been saying about the restrictive nature of professional bodies, because I think it was clear from both of what you said that you are sometimes driving change and, aren't, um, and we need to blow apart some of our internal myths about professional bodies being restrictive and so forth. But the next part is really over to the floor. So um, if people can put a hand up. There's a roving mic. Um, any questions? Well, we'll, start, we'll start with physical... Hello, my name's Alison Clark. I'm a medical manager at the University of West of Scotland in the nursing and the work and health department. And really, I'm the chair of fitness to practice stage two, the final stage. Um, and I'm wondering just really what your experiences are with um, students' social networking sites and if you have any specific guidance uh, on that one. <laughs> Try to land you with your first difficult question. Um, I mean, it is, it, it, it is an enormous issue, of course, uh, for, for students. We, we, we would expect them to be using social networking as part of life. But I think the issue really is getting them to understand uh, that about privacy settings, about once it's out there, you can't retrieve it, and about the fact that anything that they put out, even if it doesn't reach professional confidence, is available for subsequent patients, employers, and, and so on. Um, and, and so it's really pretty common sense advice. Uh, for, for doctors also it's an issue. And in fact, as part of the review of good medical practice, one of our new pieces of guidance is going to be doctors' use of social media. That will appear next month. And there are issues there that I think are equally relevant for, for undergraduate students because the principles are the same. Um, and it's really around being sensible about realising that uh, it's publicly there. And also realising that anything that you say on a, a social network site is exactly the same as if you put it in print. So it's subject to the same laws of libel and, and so on. And it's getting all that across. And one of the things I think in terms of medical curricula now is that issues like that will be raised very early on. So in year one, those will be tackled with medical students. <clears throat> We've certainly found that as technology comes in, it's often, as I mentioned earlier, student driven and actually students through school and university um, have a lot of understanding about the importance of control now over some of these sites. We've actually been finding, educating our members aged 25 to 90, mm -hmm. that <clears throat> anything they put on those sites that they don't really understand, but they're trying to be kind of young and with it, is actually a risk to them. Yeah. Um, certainly out of, our, of my 1,000 students per annum, in very broad terms, I've come across perhaps one or two cases each year where firms have dismissed students for disciplinary reasons related exactly to this area. Um, within our institute, we've tried to, to gather these sites together. We created an ICAST student Facebook page, and initially we thought, well, we have to monitor this, so the first student on it was me, um, but I got no friends, and <laughs> nobody sent me anything, and I was on no walls, and it was a bit of a disaster, and we found that we shut it down because students didn't really want their institute to have kind of a Facebook page. So we've almost given up on it, I'm afraid. Uh, Ruth Tudor, I'm with the Open University, but I'm the student part of the Open University. Um, the Open University recently announced, trying to do it quite quietly, that they were going to be moving away from printed matter onto fully online um, source material, um, which caused a bit of an uproar amongst our students because they don't want to make that move. We have the pleasure of using Moodle. Um, how are you? How are you finding the, the change from students who are used to working with books all the time being thrust from <coughs> into into an online environment? Um. We would like to move completely to online materials. Um, we would like to be in a position that students bring the laptops into all the classrooms and then into the assessment, as, as I perhaps suggested earlier. We probably think we're two to three years away from being able to actually roll that out. We find that some students would move to that immediately. Um, and, and again, I, don't want, I probably don't want to stereotype students. I maybe did a little bit earlier, but some science students very quickly would quite happily have everything on laptop. 
and they are used to working like that. We find that's probably less so with, with some other students. And much as I don't like it when my committee members give personal anecdotes, I will. I have a son who's in second year of engineering at Durham University, and he sent me a, a text on Monday to say that he'd found the library. And I thought, <laughs> two years in, what have you been doing? And he said, well, everything's on the laptop. Yeah. I had no need for a book. But now he now realizes maybe there is other areas of knowledge. Um, so certainly that's, we are moving in that direction. We would also like all of the institute's activities, boards, committees, all to be online and to move away. But we're probably two to three years away. Can I, just, just sorry, just two seconds, can I then follow that up with what do you do about accessibility issues because Moodle really is not accessible for screen readers and, and people with disabilities and things like that, so how do you get around that accessibility issue? Um, at the moment with our um, student written materials we have that problem and so we have to consider different colours of paper, different sizes of text, um, A3 and, and whatever um, and that's one of the reasons that we feel we can't bring some of these changes in quickly. When we actually brought in laptop usage into the final examination, for the first two years, we gave students the option of laptop or handwritten. And we finally got to the point it was 99% laptop, and at that point we made it a regulation and have now made it compulsory. Now, if somebody came to us with an exceptional circumstance that they couldn't type or whatever, we would look at voice recognition software or an alternative. Really. Yeah, yes, I, I was going to comment actually on the accessibility issue, because it's a very important one. Um, but I think also now in healthcare, as more and more healthcare is using uh, IT and is using uh, laptops rather than writing it down, it's actually very important that our students are able to demonstrate that they can actually cope with that sort of approach, albeit with the adjustments that you, that, that you, you suggest need to be made if, if there are particular difficulties. Um, less seriously, we actually had our first paperless GMC council meeting two weeks ago. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, it was an easy experience for all of us, but I think uh, th th there is undoubtedly a transition. So good, good luck with making a lot of your meetings paperless. <laughs> okay, next question. Hi, um, my name is Shree Warman from the University of Strathclyde. I wanted to pick up on the point that you both uh, raised in different ways, which is the relationship between HEIs and professional bodies themselves. Um, universities are big places. Uh, the impetus for innovation comes from lots of different drivers, sometimes within the discipline, sometimes uh, from external examples of practice as we find through the enhancement themes. Uh, myself, I'm involved in educational development, uh, and part of my role is working with colleagues on how to um, innovate within different disciplinary areas and increasingly we're seeing more and more uh, of an interest in creating multi-cross interdisciplinary learning opportunities. Um, one of the, and I'm sure this is probably a common experience for a number of colleagues here, one of the um, kickbacks I often receive is my professional body uh, would not possibly allow me to innovate in my own particular disciplinary area. And I was quite struck that both of you said we're actually going and saying to, to colleagues within the disciplines, you must innovate, here are some suggestions. What are your views on how um, different audiences within the university, if I can use that kind of language, might actually interact with the professional bodies so we can get, so you get the multiple perspectives of the, the pushes and pulls within an institution um, to actually address some and unpack some of these myths that we were talking about. I hope that's a very long-winded question, but I just wanted to set the context. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Who wants to take that? Jim? Yeah. Jim? Um, yes, I mean, I, I, I certainly, from the point of view of the GMC, we would absolutely expect a medical school to be showing that it is interacting with uh, I academic and other departments beyond its own borders but also that it is looking very seriously at how it can innovate. So we have a requirement now that uh, medical schools have a medical education unit which will look at didactic and pedagogic approaches uh, and that they're able to show that they are seriously looking at what they are doing. Um, we also have a requirement that uh, medical students have multi-professional training so that they're interacting with mainly other healthcare uh, individuals. But the other thing that we've done um, is we've gone to a core plus options now within the medical curriculum. So uh, the core is the majority of the course, 
but about 10 per 15 per cent is options and we encourage medical schools to show how they are developing options that are out with the medical schools so that there are uh, options within say the humanities options within the sciences and so on that students are able to take up so i think there are a variety of ways that uh, the medical schools can interact i think the point you made is a very interesting one and i think sometimes faculties hide behind the professional body in terms of actually being able to do things or, no, or not being able to do things they don't want to do. Um, my institute does accredit university accounting degrees and, and I tried today perhaps not to talk maybe as much as, about that as I might have in another environment. Um, and very broadly, we would seek to accredit around three years of the four years of a, an honours um, accounting degree. And again, very, very broadly, we would basically be seeking to accredit years one, two and three to allow year four to be as wide open for as many research driven areas, specialist topics, expertise, units of that university. Um, in our boards and committees, we have a, a very defined approach of ensuring that we've got um, engagement with all the parties that can help enhance our profession. And so on all my exam panels, um, qualification strategy boards, overseeing boards and committees, we have a number of academic representatives. And throughout our institute, we have a huge number of public interest members that we encourage to take part and to, again, oversee our work. And in my area in education, we've quite deliberately selected a public interest member who is an academic but is not an accounting academic. Um, so we feel in, in one sense that we have a good relationship, we have lots of academics involved. Equally, my own team do teach in universities periodically, and, and I've gone in and out of universities over the years and, and helped out and taught in particular courses. And we see this as a two-way. However, if I went back 15 or 20 years, it was far, far greater engagement. Far, far more of our boards and committees were academic-driven, and that has drifted and drifted over the last 15 or 20 years. And when I speak to <coughs> academic colleagues about that, it's purely down to the pressures within the university that they don't have time now to spend as much time on almost outside developing activity which helps the profession because there's so much, whether it's administration or teaching pressure or research pressure. And I guess probably very similar to the, to the medical profession, our institute does also support research as far as we can. We have research funds, research committees, and we try to interact in that way. And in probably all the university courts in Scotland will be a Scottish chartered accountant of one sort or other. We probably don't do as much as we can, but there are links there, and I would welcome as many other academics to join my boards and committees as their time would allow. Very hard to get that. Thank you. Got another question here. Hi, I'm Lucky Whiteside, um, Employee Values Manager of the Southern University's uh, Management School. Um, I was interested, uh, Mark, on your views in terms of the incorporation of work placements, internships, into undergrad accountancy degrees and whether you believe through your member um, organisations that there's an openness and willingness to engage at a greater level or not in those areas? Um, absolutely. The, the one programme in Scotland um, which has worked extremely well for many years has been through RGU and, and I guess that's a university that has that almost as part of its culture. But over the last two or three years, we've started to develop programmes in England with universities that are not used to having workplace um, periods. And a couple of the programmes I had up in one of the earlier slides to do with Exeter University, Birmingham University, and indeed previously Lancaster, are programmes where really research-based universities have changed their approaches to start and have work placements right in the middle of their programmes. And we've indeed found in our two programmes we've developed in last year with a firm called KPMG, a big firm of accountants in Exeter and Birmingham, that KPMG wants students to work not from June to August, which suit the universities, they want the students to work from January to April, that suits counting year ends, tax year ends and so on. So what's happened is that those universities that you might have thought of as not being open to change in very traditional, very research-driven universities, they've now started teaching whole programs over the summertime. And that's given some really interesting challenges in terms of university contracts. Where do the researchers then find the time to do their researchers, to, to do the research, and to build programs around that? Um, in terms of employers, RGU, 
Um, there might be one or two people here from RGU. I'm a visiting professor there myself, but they have some really, really strong relationships with the local community and the Grampians, and, and indeed actually elsewhere, where they are able to place students with excellent experience. And as a professional body, I accredit that one year of experience towards my three years of qualification. So that somebody who gains that within the university has already got that banked and has less work experience to do once they graduate. Therefore, that can now make that very attractive program to students, particularly, I guess, in England with um, student debt. And the programs at Exeter, uh, Lancaster, and Birmingham have been hugely successful. Jim, coming briefly on that. Um, clearly, within medical and, and clinical courses, workplace uh, experience is very important. About 60% of our medical student experience is actually in the workplace in the NHS. That is absolutely essential and, and, and clearly very important. But it does create some difficulties. And one of the great difficulties is really how do you get a, a similarity of experience across different ones. So students may not have the, an identical experience when they're in different placements. How do you ensure it's equivalent? And also, how do you ensure uh, the reliability of any assessment that may be done by very large numbers of individuals who each only are seeing a small number of students? So I think there are particular issues if you've large numbers of students and who are also being assessed whilst they're in the, the, the placements. Next question. Who else has got a question? Brian. Okay. Yeah, Brian Woodrum from Edinburgh Napier University. Um, I was interested in some of the innovations that both of, of you were discussing, and uh, particularly in, in Mark's observation that um, with regard to employers trusting their students and uh, a bit of suspicion around some of the online student centred learning. And I know that the focus of today is really around the bridge between HEI and, and the profession. But I just wonder, with the, the comment again that was made about the continuum of medical education, you know, whether enough of a focus is there on um, lifelong learning within the profession, and whether there, there comes a point where we kind of stop. And that might actually cause a problem with innovation at the, the front end of the educational and, and uh, learning experience, and whether um, either Mark or, or Jim has got any comment to make on that uh, continuum and, and how we manage that, both uh, from the HEI perspective and, and linking into the professions. But, and just before you answer, I think that's got both the as educators and as profession, professionals side to it. Um, who wants to kick off? Uh, you go. Jim. Uh, I mean, I think that there are. I think it's a very important <coughs> issue, and I think it's one that we haven't paid enough attention to in the past. I think various ways that we are trying to address it is, first of all, by creating generic outcomes that extend across the whole of your profession, and where you have to demonstrate that you are continuing to uh, address them and are continuing to look at uh, how you can develop them further. And that for uh, doctors who are, uh, who are now uh, specialists or GPs will apply through revalidation. So an important part of revalidation will be demonstrating that they have appropriate CPD that's mapped against the outcomes in, in, in good medical practice. So that's one way. I think the second way is also uh, making particularly CPD much more focused on how we deliver it. At the moment, CPD within the medical profession uh, is there and there's a requirement that you do so many CPD hours per year of accredited learning and so on. But it's not terribly well structured. It's not necessarily appropriate to the role that we're doing. It's all a bit old fashioned in how it's being delivered. And so we're beginning to look at various approaches as to how that might be dealt with uh, so that individuals even uh, towards the end of their career are being confronted with uh, both new approaches to learning, but also new, new approaches within the professional <coughs> discipline. Can I just ask you, um, in planning CPD, yeah. maybe it isn't sufficiently planned, but um, is there a way in which people are encouraged to address some of their less strong areas? I, 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 up, until, up until now, not terribly well. But what has happened over the last five years or so is that uh, appraisal has become much more uh, strong for doctors. And now all doctors must have an annual appraisal. 
and one of the things that will address are areas of potential weakness which will uh, then uh, lead to uh, a development plan which will be partly CPD, maybe other things as well. And that appraisal then will feed into the revalidation decision. So we're beginning to get a handle on it, but it hasn't been terribly well done up until now, I think. Thank you. Um, two observations, Brian. Just picking up your introductory point on monitoring, when we brought in our virtual learning environment about three years ago, one of the large accounting firms offered a pilot group of 60 new graduates in Scotland. So basically the, the group were around 22 year old and they were split male and female. And one of the things the virtual learning environment does is it, it shows when a student logs on, it shows when they've triggered off various assessment points, it shows when they've completed their day's learning. So we created a program that was six hours of work. The students had five days, six hours a day. And what the, the, um, the pilot group showed, and my colleagues don't like me using this publicly, but the pilot group showed that the 30 young ladies generally started at 6 a.m. and had finished by noon, and almost none of the men had started. They started about three in the afternoon and generally finished by midnight. Now, we haven't gone on and monitored this in our institute, but actually the accounting firms that I've spoken to about this issue of trust have said, ah, but we can monitor the time our employees are getting up when they start the work and when they finish it. And I find this horrifying, but they found that as something that was a benefit of this scheme. So we're trying to maybe re-educate them slightly. On the, the CPD and the continuing learning, um, ICAS are, are, are following exactly the route on generic outcomes. Our approach is an output-based approach in the UK, I say that quite specifically. In the rest of the accounting world, it's an input-based approach. It's ours only with no linkage to outcomes in most other countries. The UK took a view on CPD around three years ago that we wanted to be a pure output-based method. So how the, the method works is at the beginning of the year, Brian, who's a chartered accountant, and myself, we are expected, and I'm sure we both do this, Brian, to write out a plan of what we seek to have our development activity during the year and what it will achieve once it's done. And during the year, either at appraisal or at the year end, and speaking to my chief executive, for instance, he will then consider whether I've done that, where I need to go next, did the development plan meet its targets. That works well in organisations where you've got a hierarchy and lots of fellow professionals. Many of our members work on their own. They can be quite distant in organisations and it's very difficult, I think, following such a structured CPD approach if you are out on your own, even actually overseas. And, and that's something that our output approach maybe doesn't solve particularly well. But certainly having a continuum of learning with the same generic outcomes is very much in our thinking similarly to the, the GMC. Thank you. At the back, uh, Sarah. <coughs> Sorry. Hi, I'm Fiona Miller, University of West Scotland. I'm interested, you know, when you were talking about the context and the history, because obviously your professional bodies have been around for a long time. Uh, I'm, I work in the School of Creative and Cultural Industries, so of course the professional bodies are much newer. And I'm interested in how much sharing, how much communication is there between the different professional bodies because you've had all these years of experience and testing things out. How much opportunity do you get to try and guide some of the, the younger, as it were, professional bodies? Um, maybe I, I, I could speak to that. Certainly within healthcare, there is quite a lot of discussion between the various regulators. Uh, both around regulation of the profession but also around educational matters. And there is actually a body called the Council for Healthcare Regulatory Excellence, CHRE, which is the regulator of the regulators. And it will actually often uh, facilitate some of these discussions and some of these interactions. Mm -hmm. And certainly some of the new professions in medicine have come and talked to bodies like <coughs> NMS, the University of Nursing and Welfare Council and GMC when they've been setting up their education and other structures. So, so it does go on within healthcare. Um, there's an organisation called PARN, P-A-R-N, Professional Associations Research Network. And this is an organisation which has, I think, relatively low subscriptions for small size member bodies and, and obviously much larger for bigger. Um, it's based in Bristol. It's a um, pan-UK organisation. And it does all sorts of um, education-themed material. It ha talks about regulatory standards. It talks about disciplinary standards. 
um, membership support groups. And it also provides information on things like salary benchmarking for professional associations that one can subscribe to. And I know my institute, for instance, periodically has subscribed to that to try and then get comparative salary information to pay staff, which can be quite difficult. We're neither a charity, really, nor are we a commercial. And that sort of challenge it can often need the thoughts of others. So um, I find that periodically a very useful group. They do a very good training programs as well for professional staff. And indeed, I got an email the other day about CPD conference that were running on CPD changes with a very wide range of speakers. And we periodically would send staff on that. So it's probably the best group. Um, as a, a professional institute on our own, most of the other accounting bodies in the UK we compete with. So we describe them as our sister bodies, but I don't know if one competes with one sister, but um, we do. So we exchange things with them, but just not the really interesting stuff. Uh, so. I've realised that I've been a bit a bad and wicked chair because it's now five past five. Uh, so can I thank Mark and Jim very much and may we all just thank them in the usual way. <laughs>